Hey, Super Mamas, it's Dr. Joy here, and you are watching Delivering Joy MD TV. Welcome to Super Mama Sunday, where we've been talking about birth emergencies. These are rare emergencies that can occur during birthing. Today, we are talking about probably the most common birth emergency, and that is emergency cesarean delivery or emergency C-section. Make sure that you keep watching to hear all about this important birth emergency. All right, Super Mama. So as I've said throughout this entire series on birth emergencies, these are rare. That means that they rarely happen. However, when they do happen, it is vitally important that the OB care team and that mama and support people know what's going on and how they can all work together towards the goal of birthing safely. So these videos are not meant in any way to promote fear of the birthing space. Today we are talking about emergency cesarean delivery, and this is probably the birth emergency that happens most. I hope that you are watching this with a support person, someone who's gonna be attending your birth and being there to support you through the process because this is important for support folks to know as well. So, as I said, cesarean birth is one of the most common birth emergencies that can occur, and it can be occur for several reasons. Um, but about two to 15% of labors actually end in emergent cesarean birth. Now, I'm gonna give you some reasons that um, are most common for cesarean births, but there can be many other reasons. So it's very important that you're keeping up with your OB care team and asking questions and getting answers so that you understand what's happening during your birth. And if there is a need for some sort of emergent procedure, you understand the reason why. Very important. So in looking at this topic, I was really interested to find out like, how many emergent cesarean births are done and you know, what are some of the reasons? So really just looking at the evidence, at the research that's out there. And I was really kind of surprised at the lack of information that's out there. Uh, I found very wide varieties of, in terms of incidents, like how many of these are we doing? Um, and I found a wide variety of reasons that these were done. And to be honest, just between me and you, I don't really know if all of these reasons are reasons that I would do in emergency section, but hey, that's just me. So I wanna kind of give you guys some ideas as to why um, this may occur. The number one reason that people have emergent cesarean deliveries are because of abnormal fetal heart tracing. This is the heart rate tracing that you may see when you are uh, on labor and delivery or if you're doing monitoring in a birthing center or at home. This is the baby's actual heart rate pattern. And so if your baby has an abnormal heart rate pattern, this could be a sign that the baby is in distress. The only problem with this is that fetal monitoring has not necessarily been proven to improve outcomes for babies. And honestly, if we really look at the evidence and the data, sometimes continuous fetal monitoring actually just increases the number of interventions we're doing. And so this is a really hot topic right now in the OB care community. We're talking about ways to safely reduce the C-section rate. And so we have to be very careful because if a baby is in fact in distress and we don't do a timely delivery, that baby may have some long-term complications or could even die. So it's a definitely a tightrope that we're walking here between not doing a bunch of unnecessary interventions versus potentially saving a baby's or a mom's life by performing an emergency cesarean delivery. And when I, we say abnormal, we're talking about decelerations, fetal heart rate decelerations, or fetal tachycardia. So with fetal heart rate decelerations, what we're seeing is a drop in the baby's heartbeat. And these are usually going to be drops that are recurrent, that are happening you know, over and over again with each contraction, 
or where the baby's heart rate drops and stays down. And so a normal fetal heart rate should be between 110 and 160. Now you can see some variations in the baby's heart rate pattern. You can see it go up and down, and then we have what are called accelerations where the baby's heart rate goes up above the baby's baseline heart rate by at least 15 beats and stays up there for at least 15 seconds. And so those accelerations are actually good. So let's say your baby's baseline heart rate is 160 and your baby jumps up to 180 for say a minute or so and then comes back down to the baseline of 160. That's actually good. But what if your baby's heart rate drops down to 90 and stays there for a few minutes? That can be a sign of fetal distress. Or if the baby's heart rate goes up to the 180s and stays there for more than 10 minutes, that could also be a sign of distress. So we're kind of watching this fetal heart rate tracing. And that's why we often have moms hooked up to monitors. It is perfectly okay if you are not a very high risk birth for you to do intermittent monitoring where you're getting up and moving around and then getting on the monitor at least once an hour. And that's perfectly acceptable for women who don't have a really high risk birth, who have normal uh, fetal heart rate tracings before they get off the monitor. So there are some options versus being kind of stuck in the bed, especially if you're laboring without an uh, epidural and you want to keep moving. So. I'm going to show you a couple of fetal heart rate patterns that are ominous, meaning it ain't looking so good for the home team, so that you can kind of see these and understand. And that way, if you happen to see something like this in your birth, you got a little bit of knowledge. I think it's really important for uh, mamas to be very knowledgeable and for support people to be very knowledgeable. So the first one I want to show you is what's called late decelerations. Late decelerations. That means that this baby's heart rate is dropping after each contraction and these should be recurrent before we call an emergency cesarean delivery. And so this is what a late deceleration looks like. And if these are recurrent, that can be a sign of fetal distress. I wanted to also show you some recurrent deep variable decelerations. Variable decelerations can happen um, and be related to a contraction or not related to a contraction. And sometimes they can spontaneously occur. And when they are very deep, meaning that the baby's heart rate drops suddenly and it drops really low, and you see them coming you know, with every contraction or that they're coming back to back, this can be a sign that the umbilical cord is compressed and that the baby's not getting good oxygen. So this too would be a reason why we would consider moving for cesarean delivery and that we should talk to you um, about the potential that baby may need to be delivered as quickly as possible. Now there is one other type of fetal heart rate deceleration called an early deceleration. And this is when the contraction occurs and the baby's heart rate dips in sync with the contraction. And these actually are not ominous at all. These are signs that your baby's head is getting down into the vaginal canal. So baby is on the way to the exit. And so these are actually things that we like to see because that means that the baby is descending and getting into the birth canal. Next, let's talk about fetal tachycardia. Fetal tachycardia is where the baby's heart rate jumps up above 60 and stays there for at least 10 minutes. This can be a sign of infection inside the uterus. It can be a sign that the baby is not getting adequate oxygen or blood supply. So this too is ominous. And especially if you have fetal tachycardia where the baby's heart rate is high and you couple that with decelerations like late decelerations or variable decelerations. So this is something that doesn't look great. The other thing to consider with fetal heart rate tracing is the variability. And variability is really just the beat to beat change. So baby's heart rates should change 
moment to moment and you should see that there is some variance in that actual heart rate. Variability is actually the biggest sign of fetal well-being. So if a baby has good variability, even if they're having some dips in the heart rates, like some decelerations that are late or variable in nature, as long as there is still good variability, sometimes we can ride those decelerations out. And by ride it out, I mean give you more time to progress in your labor, to get your cervix fully dilated and see if we could potentially have a vaginal delivery versus a cesarean delivery. Prolonged deceleration is where the baby's heart rate drops below 110 and stays down. These are terrifying because we know that if the baby's heart rate is staying down for long uh, minutes, you know, more than a minute or two, we're getting to the point where there is not enough blood flow and oxygen to that baby. And then we start to run the risk of what's called fetal hypoxemia, or basically baby without enough oxygen in the blood. And, you know, not having enough oxygen in the blood eventually leads to hypoxia, meaning the baby doesn't have enough oxygen in the body going to the vital organs. And this is where we can really get into some serious trouble. So when we see these prolonged D cells where the baby's heart is not recovering to its normal baseline heartbeat, this is probably the number one reason that we are going to really be asking you for your consent to do an emergency cesarean delivery. So let's think about these decelerations and why they actually occur. So one thing that I did a couple of years ago was I got certified in electronic fetal monitoring because I really wanted to understand what I'm looking at when I look at that fetal heart rate tracing. So during a contraction, when the uterus clamps down and contracts and pushes that baby towards the birth canal, the blood flow to the uterus and therefore the blood flow to the placenta, the umbilical cord and the baby gets cut off for about 45 to 90 seconds. And so I always equate this for my patients to a pool. So you know how you can see some people who swim all the way across the pool under the water, never need to come up for air. And then you see some people who come up for air like every other stroke when they're swimming across that pool. This has to do with your ability to conserve oxygen and develop an oxygen reserve. So your baby has that same ability. Babies who have good reserve can hang out in a contracting uterus with no problem and you won't see any change in their heart rate if they've got good reserve. So that contraction can happen, the oxygen can be cut off and they're just fine. You know, you can see their fetal heart rate tracing is just bobbing along, no problems. But then there are babies who may not have great oxygen reserve. And so when the blood flow and the oxygen is cut off to the uterus and to the placenta, these babies' heart rates will start to drop. So that is really what we're looking at when we're looking at the contractions and then what happens to the baby's heart rate. One thing I'd like to note is that contractions really need to be at least two to three minutes apart to give that baby some time to recover. So if the contractions are happening every one minute, that baby may not have a lot of time to recover good blood flow through the placenta and umbilical cord so that that baby can get plenty of oxygen before the next contraction occurs. So whenever I see a contraction pattern that where the contractions are really close together, that's called tachycystole or basically contractions coming too closely together. So I always try to do something to stop the contractions for a little bit. Give that baby a chance to recover. We can do that by stopping medication called Pitocin if you're on that. Um, Pitocin causes contractions to occur. We usually like to get it to the point where the Pitocin is just high enough for your contractions to be two to three minutes apart. 
If you're not on Pitocin, but you're contracting too frequently, there is medication that we can give that's an injection that helps to slow down the contractions and space them out a little bit so baby can have some time to recover more oxygen. That medicine could be given even if you're on Pitocin and we've turned it off and your contractions are not spacing out enough, that injection, that terbutylene injection can also be given. So these are things that I think about when I see a really strong, frequent contraction pattern is kind of giving the baby some room to get more oxygen on board. In addition, positioning can be important. So positioning you on your left or right side helps bring more blood flow back to your heart so that your heart can pump it to the lungs, get up a bunch of oxygen and then pump it to the baby, to the uterus and the placenta. Um, so that's one option. And then adding oxygen. So putting a face mask on you uh, where you can get additional oxygen in your blood to push to the baby. That's another uh, way that we can help things. So slowing up the contraction speed, delivering more oxygen to mama so that she can get that oxygen to her baby and also repositioning mama can be very helpful. So these are things that we should try prior to um, you know, consenting you for a C-section. I am a big fan of trying not to do emergent, crazy, drama-filled C-sections. And so if I notice that this mama is having some trouble with the fetal heart rate tracing or the contractions are too close together or that we think she needs repositioning and oxygen, I try to go ahead and start having that conversation so that mom is aware that there are some issues going on and that we may need to do an intervention particularly for my mamas who are uh, laboring without an epidural. I always ask about an epidural if I'm getting concerned about the baby's fetal heart rate tracing. And we've done everything that we can do to make sure that the contractions are spaced more widely apart, that she's in a good position that allows for maximum blood return to her heart so that she can push that blood to her baby and that she's been given some additional oxygen. If these things don't really seem to be helping, then I'm gonna be talking to that mama about perhaps getting an epidural because in the event that an emergency happens and we need to proceed to a cesarean delivery right away, an epidural is a great thing to have. While epidural may not be your choice, if your baby's having trouble with the heart rate, Having an epidural in place will really speed up our ability to get that baby delivered quickly and safely. If you have an epidural, that epidural would simply be dosed if we determine that there's a need for an emergency section and you give consent for us to move forward with that. The epidural is a tiny catheter that's in the back and you can actually push numbing medicine through that catheter that will keep mama numb from the breast all the way to her feet. And so while nothing works 100% of the time, usually an epidural will work and you can dose it and mom can be awake during her cesarean delivery so that she can see and meet her baby and so that her support person who she chooses can go back to the operating room with her. So having an epidural has lots of benefits. In addition, if you don't have an epidural and it becomes an emergency and we you know, see that you're kind of headed down that road where baby is really not doing well with those contractions and we can see that this baby might be in distress, then you know that epidural being in place really helps us speed things along. And it also makes it possible for you to avoid general anesthesia. So for mamas who are laboring without an epidural, and there's nothing wrong with that, you can totally do that if that's your preference, um, those mamas may have to go under general anesthesia. And what that does is it puts mama to sleep, but it also puts the baby to sleep. And so we have to really proceed with that surgery very quickly to try to avoid knocking baby out to the point where the baby doesn't want to wake up and take that first very important set of deep breaths. 
The other issue with general anesthesia for emergency C-sections is that many times for general anesthesia, you need to give a relaxant medication or a paralytic that relaxes all the muscles. Well, when you do that, you relax the uterus, which is a big muscle. So that increases your risk for postpartum hemorrhage. This is one of the biggest reasons why having an epidural or a spinal anesthesia is so helpful because your uterus can still contract back down to a smaller size after the baby comes out so that you can minimize the amount of bleeding that you do after your birth. So I wanted to just kind of paint the picture a little bit for you guys about what may happen during emergency cesarean delivery. It can be super dramatic, which is why I'm a big fan of thinking ahead. If I notice that that baby is not tolerating those contractions well and we're seeing drops in the heart rate, or if I notice that the heart rate is higher than it should be and it's staying up despite the measures that we try to take to bring it back to normal, then I'm gonna go ahead and start talking about this with mom and her support people and ask her permission uh, for us to maybe consider getting an epidural um, or you know, just to keep her updated and keep the support team updated as to how things are going. Because by being proactive, you can really reduce all the fear, anxiety, and trauma that can go on in some of these emergent deliveries. Um, when we see that the baby is showing signs of distress, despite our efforts of spacing out contractions, giving mom additional oxygen so she can push more oxygen to her baby or positioning mom in a way that maximizes blood flow back to the heart so that she can pump that blood to the uterus and give baby more oxygen, then we need to have a conversation. Again, debriefing the situation, talking about what's going on and getting your informed consent are absolutely key. And we need to be able to do that quickly if we think that your baby is seriously in distress. Hold on to your horses. If you have given informed consent for an emergency C-section, things are going to move very quickly. And so you may see a lot of people suddenly running into the room, trying to reposition you, you know, placing more oxygen, um, trying to get you prepared. So they may be wiping off your belly. Sometimes they may clip, clip the hair in your pubic area so that it's down low enough so that it doesn't, it doesn't interfere with the spot where the incision for a C-section would, would be made. They may be asking you to sign consent forms. It's really gonna feel overwhelming and scary. And it's totally okay for you to have a good cry a lot of moms do and that's fine but the one thing you want to focus on is if this is a true emergency do I really need an emergency c-section I often am a big fan of checking the cervix again if we haven't checked your cervix within the last 30 minutes um, maybe because you didn't want to check or it's you know this is just kind of a sudden change in your baby's heart rate then um, checking to see if you are dilated all the way to an eight or a nine or even 10, this might give us a way to try to help reposition, add oxygen, and see if we can get to a vaginal delivery, which is always our goal. But if your cervix is not dilated and this baby is showing true signs of distress, then we need to move quickly to go back for an emergency section. The entire time, we should be talking to you and your support person, just letting you know, hey mama, hang in there with us. This is really an emergency. It's gonna be a little overwhelming. It's gonna feel scary. We're gonna take great care of you. Just kind of reassuring you the entire time. Support people, whoever it is that 
has been chosen by the mama or designated as her support person in the operating room will need to get dressed out to go to the operating room with the rest of mama's care team. So your goal is to reassure mom, make sure that you're standing close to her, being present in her space, but getting yourself ready so that you're ready to roll when mama is. In the event that this is so emergent and we are laboring without an epidural, it may be that you will need to hang back in the mama's room or in the waiting room if she has to go under general anesthesia. And that's simply because when she's asleep and she's not breathing on her own, the anesthesia team needs to be completely focused on her and how she's doing. And so we don't allow support people back in the operating room when moms are asleep. That doesn't mean that you can't be present once the baby um, is birthed, but for the time being, if this is a serious emergency, try to just get as much information as you can by asking questions. And you may wanna hang close to the nursery if you aren't asked to wait in a room or in the waiting room, because normally that mama is gonna be under general anesthesia until her surgery is completely done. So you can provide support to the baby. For me and my support people, I really like it if they can be present in the nursery. And if the baby is doing well, try to just be present for bonding with that baby right away and even doing some skin to skin. So you can put baby um, belly to belly, chest to chest with you in the nursery until mama is recovered and able to do that bonding with baby. So if mom is laboring with an epidural or we feel that we have got enough time to try to place what's called a spinal, a spinal is just a shot in the same space where the epidural would go, but instead of leaving that tiny catheter there, you just shoot the medicine in and it will numb mama from the breast to the feet. So it may seem like you're being rushed by all these people and that we're all kind of running to the operating room. But these cases that are true emergencies are really meant to try to save baby's life and in some cases to save mom's life. So if we're not talking to you, talk to us because this is a very stressful situation for everybody involved, the team and certainly mama and her support person. So once you have given consent and designated a support person, if we're going to have time to place a spinal or if you already have an epidural, what will happen is you will be taken to the operating room and they're going to uh, put you on the operating table. If you can move, it's very helpful. If you can help us move you, if you're not able to move, that's okay. We'll have that um, team ready to help you move to the operating room bed. Then your belly will be cleaned off and depending on how much distress we think baby is in, we may also just splash the belly with cleanser and proceed right away with the emergent cesarean delivery. Once your belly has been prepped, then we want to go ahead and put up some curtains that are called drapes. And once those drapes are up, then we will test to make sure that you are nice and numb, especially if you have an epidural or a spinal and you're going to be awake. And so there's a testing process where we actually use some pinchers that pinch your belly and you should not be able to feel anything sharp. You may feel pressure, like having the sensation that something or someone is touching you, and that's normal, but you should not feel anything sharp. If you do, call it out because we wanna make sure that you are nice and numb prior to having any sort of incision made on your belly for a belly birth. Once we have determined that you're nice and numb, then your support person will be invited in to sit behind the curtain with you, hold your hand, talk to you, you know, and just kind of be present in that space for support. If we find that you either have a spinal or epidural that's not working properly and you're still feeling pain, or if you have to go under general anesthesia because we don't have time to place a spinal or an epidural, then your support person will wait outside of the operating room. After you're completely numb or asleep, we will proceed with the cesarean delivery where we're cutting through the skin, the fat, 
the tight wall that covers your abdominal muscles called the fascia and will spread the muscles and then enter into the belly and the uterus will be right there and we will make an incision on the uterus and that is how we will actually help you birth your baby through a belly birth. Sometimes for moms that are awake, when baby is being birthed, the assistant is going to push down at the top of your uterus to help facilitate the birth since you're not able to actually push. And so that may feel like a ton of pressure or like somebody's actually sitting on your chest. And we should be telling you this, like, okay, mama, lots of pressure, lots of pressure. And that way you're kind of prepared for that, what that feels like. And once the baby is, is birthed through the belly, then we're going to dry it off. If baby is looking okay, crying, uh, moving, it's pretty vigorous, then we will still perform delayed cord clamping just as we would in a normal vaginal delivery and dry baby off and stimulate baby right there at the bedside. Once I have clamped the cord, for me, I like to actually leave the cord long so that dad can or a support person can go ahead and trim the rest of that cord so they don't miss that really, really special moment. And if you leave the cord long, it's a trick of mine, it looks like the support person is cutting the cord when you take pictures. Usually, if things are okay and you uh, nor baby is in a dire emergency, somebody can capture some of those moments for you. So I always encourage support people to bring a phone or a camera with them to the operating room. If baby's not doing so well, if we've got like an emergency team in there working on baby, or if mama's not doing so well, then this might not be possible. So be flexible about capturing these moments on film because it may not be possible if we're all working as hard as we can to keep you and your baby safe. So once baby is out, if baby is doing well, the baby will be brought to you for you to see and fall in love with and for you and your partner hopefully to capture some of these moments on camera. If baby is not doing well and needs to go in what's called an isolate, which is a, a like an incubator and to be taken straight to the nursery, then we'll still make sure that you get to lay eyes on your baby if you're awake. So depending on what institution you're having your baby at, most C-section babies are either going to be assessed really well directly inside of the C-section room, there is a baby warmer, and there will be a pediatric team there to assess the baby. In some places, the baby's initially assessed in the C-section room and then taken to the nursery for even more thorough assessment. Uh, but that really depends on the institution. And if you, you know, have questions about this, this is definitely something to ask about when you're touring your labor and delivery unit for the first time or if you can't tour because of COVID, you can certainly talk with the labor and delivery staff or director so that you can ask these sorts of questions about what happens when baby is born. It is usually always okay for your labor support person um, or your, your partner to go with the baby to the nursery unless we think this is a really serious situation and baby's not doing well. And so in that instance, we would have the labor support person stay with you. If you are really anxious or nervous or afraid and you want your labor support person to stay with you, you could also designate another member of your support team to travel with the baby to the nursery in the event that baby is doing well and we don't have any concerns. So once baby's out and you've had a chance to lay eyes on that baby, if you're awake, then it's time to close everything back. So we need to close the uterus back and we usually like to try to do that in a double layer closure. Most emergency sections are due to a non-reassuring fetal heart tracing, then you may be a great candidate for what's called a vaginal birth after cesarean or VBAC. So that double layer closure just reinforces the muscle of the uterus so that if you do decide to have a vaginal birth after cesarean, your risk of uterine rupture is slightly lower. 
Speaking of uterine rapture, let's talk a little bit more about some of the other rare causes of emergent C-section. So we already talked about the heart rate issue, but uterine rupture can be another reason that you need an emergent cesarean delivery. Of course, uterine rupture is more likely in women who have had a prior C-section. And so the more C-sections you had, the higher your risk of uterine rupture. But uterine rupture rarely occurs in women who have never had a C-section. So I often talk to mamas about whether or not they've had any kind of surgery on their uterus. If you've had any sort of incision made on your uterus, like let's say you had fibroids removed or you had some sort of repair done to the uterus, then that increases your risk for uterine rupture. But even if you've never had anything done to your uterus, the uterus can rupture. And so it's very important that this is recognized. And the first sign of this is usually the baby's heart rate tracing is abnormal. So we're back to the abnormal fetal heart rate tracing. Cord prolapse is another reason for emergent cesarean delivery. And cord prolapse basically means that the cord is prolapsing or coming through the cervix. The baby's head is not really well applied to the cervix, meaning it's not really down in the pelvis sticking up against the cervix. The cord can actually come through when the water breaks or sometimes it can come through even with regular contractions. And when this happens, the thing you usually see is abnormal fetal heart rate tracing. And so what will happen is you'll start to see this. Maybe someone asks permission to check the cervix to see, okay, your water just broke. Let me just see if if the cord is coming through. And if you feel that cord, what we have to do is keep our fingers in the vagina and kind of try to keep the pressure off that cord. So this is certainly an emergency. And if you are not ready to deliver your baby uh, right then and there, then we need to proceed for emergent cesarean delivery because when the cord is prolapsed, there's usually too much pressure on the cord. It's squeezing the cord so tightly that blood and oxygen cannot get to your baby. So whoever checks that, that cervix and determines that the cord is coming through it needs to push that cord up as good as best they can, try to keep tension and pressure off the cord, and they're gonna be riding on that bed with you with their fingers still in the vagina, and they're gonna be riding to the C-section room and we will do you know, an emergent cesarean delivery as long as you have given your consent for that. And that person will not remove their hands until we are able to deliver that baby. So they are artificially keeping the cord from coming through the cervix and choking off the oxygen flow to your baby. Placental abruption means that the placenta is coming off the side of the uterine wall early. Now remember that the placenta is a big network of blood vessels that are bringing oxygenated blood and nutrients from mom to baby. So the placenta is where the baby is actually connected to mama's uterus. And so the baby's blood and the mama's blood are mixing together in the placenta so that oxygen and nutrients can flow out of the placenta into the umbilical cord into your baby. Then all the waste uh, from your baby is going to be pushed back through the umbilical cord and into the placenta and into your bloodstream so that you can get rid of things like carbon dioxide. So in an abruption, it is basically the disconnection between mom and baby. And this can be very serious because not only can mom be losing blood from where that placenta disconnected, but the baby can be losing blood as well. And pregnancy helps us prepare for blood loss by increasing our blood volume, but the baby does not have a whole lot of blood. And that's why this becomes such an emergency because if the baby is still pumping blood to that placenta and the placenta is no longer attached, baby is losing blood and baby cannot afford to lose nearly the amount of blood that a mama could afford to lose. So this becomes an emergency. And so with all of these things, we need to be communicating with you. We need to be asking your informed consent, but listen, mama, 
this may not be a sit down conversation where we sit down and go through all the pros and the cons and the risks and the benefits because the longer we wait when a baby is truly in distress, the more likely that baby is to have some long-term damage like cerebral palsy or brain damage. And so we, there is clear evidence that when a baby is clearly in distress, the longer you wait, the more likely they are to have some very serious complications from not having enough oxygen for long minutes. So if you have questions, ask those questions. If you, you know, need to know a little bit more before signing the consent, certainly ask questions. But keep in mind, the, the longer we delay, the more likely we are to have some long-term complications for baby and in some cases for you. So based on all the body of research that's out there, we know we need to be helping you deliver that baby via belly birth within 30 minutes. So if we see that there is a reason that we need to be doing an emergency section, then the idea is that we need decision to delivery time to be less than 30 minutes. This is associated with much better outcomes for both mom and baby. So the time from decision to do the C-section to making an incision to help you facilitate a belly birth should be 30 minutes or less. Now, depending on where you are and what's going on at your hospital and the resources that that hospital has, we may or may not be able to make that happen. I'm really blessed that I work in a facility that has 24 seven anesthesia that's dedicated to labor and delivery and that we also have 24 hour surgical staff that's on the floor and ready to you know, go if something were to happen. But the goal is 30 minutes between the time that we talk to you about an emergency section versus having the baby out. So that's the goal is that 30 minutes from decision to delivery time. So we talked about once baby is out and kind of the emergency situation has passed that we're gonna be closing everything up. We close up the uterus, we close up the peritoneum and muscle and the peritoneum is like a little plastic wrap that covers your organs on the inside. And so we close that, uh, we close the muscle and then we close that tight band across the muscle called the fascia and move on to the, the fat that lives below your skin. We close that and then we close the skin and the skin can be closed in multiple ways. We can use dissolvable staples. We can use dissolvable stitches, which is what I prefer. And we can also use um, staples that go above the skin. So there are lots of different ways that the skin can be closed. If you have a preference, then shout that out. Um, I, I encourage people to ask for dissolvable sutures because we know that it decreases the risk of wound infection by about 12% versus uh, having staples. In. If you had planned to have a tubal ligation done, let's say you were planning to have a vaginal birth, which is what we should all be planning for uh, if possible, but let's say you were planning to come back in a few weeks and have uh, a tubal ligation. In the event that you need to proceed to emergent cesarean delivery, then shout that out. I was planning to get my tubes tied because if you're gonna already have surgery, there's no need to have to come back for a second surgery weeks later. So the tubes can be tied while you're there. Um, there are some rules based on the state that you're in uh, and even some rules that have to do with certain insurances. But if it's possible to have your tubes tied during an emergency section, it's much better than having to come back weeks later and have another abdominal surgery. So certainly this can be a really traumatic experience. It, it can be really overwhelming. And especially if you were planning on a vaginal birth, things were going along just fine. And then boom, suddenly I'm running for an emergency C-section. It can really um, take a toll on your mental health and your um, feelings of safety in the birthing space. 
So it's really important to debrief this again. And like I said, we don't want to delay and cause long-term complications for you or your baby, but we do need to sit down once everything is calm and go over again with you the reasons why we asked you um, to proceed to an emergent cesarean delivery, whether or not you're a good candidate for a vaginal birth after cesarean is something that we could talk about. And then um, just about your feelings about the birth so that you can express those things. Post-traumatic stress disorder after birth emergencies is a real thing. And I think it's so important that we're talking about that, enrolling in counseling if we need to, and really helping you cope with that. Because we know that mamas who have birth emergencies often have a harder time with um, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, postpartum depression, or even postpartum anxiety. So very important that we talk about this. So again, while birth emergencies are rare, this is actually one of the most common ones uh, that patients tell me about all the time. I had to have an emergency C-section because of this or that or the other. And so it's really important that um, that you understand why you had that C-section um, and you know that whether or not you're a good candidate for a vaginal birth after cesarean. So talking to your OB care team is absolutely key. I hope you found this video helpful. I would love to hear about your stories, about your questions and concerns down in the comments. And I would also love it if you give this video a thumbs up and share it with anybody who could use it. Make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss a single Super Mama Sunday episode. And I'll catch you next week, Super Mamas. Peace.